All right. Okay, so yeah, Trey's son, son Jan, I hope I'm saying your name right, but um, four years, Trey is brand new, Abe's brand new, Owen's brand new, great. Well, son Jan, you got a little bit of experience, which is awesome. Um, the things we're gonna talk about for you and for everybody else, um, it's called the mortgage process. And this is this is information that's gonna be so valuable for all of you um, as, as agents and realtors to understand what it is your clients go through, what's expected of them um, as part of the lending process. You all are gonna have clients that are buying homes and you obviously don't wanna spend any time or not very much time with a prospective client if they have not been pre-approved and vetted out can actually get financing. Um, that's Realtor 101 is don't spend too much time with the buyer if they don't have their ducks in, uh, in a row when it comes to financing. And so it's important that you kind of understand what that process is. You understand some terminology, things that we're going to be saying agents, uh, excuse me, loan officers are going to be talking to you about terminology in terms we're going to talk to your clients about. The more educated you are, the more up to speed you are with some basics when it comes to lending, um, the better you're going to be and the better you'll be able to serve your clients. So we're going to talk about a bunch of the mortgage process today, as well as some basics, terminology, what your clients go through. We'll tell you exactly the process they're going to go through so that you have a great idea of what that looks like. Um, and as we go through this, you're going to come away super educated, a much better agent to be able to serve your clients. But I want to make sure this is a, a two-way dialogue. I'm going to be doing, obviously doing most of the talking, but use the chat box to ask any questions that come up. Um, situations, scenarios, whatever that you want, you have a question about. Um, I'm not sure I can take any of you off mute. Maybe you can take yourselves yeah. off mute. Well, I have it to where they can unmute. And okay, there's so there's so few of you that if you want to unmute yourself um, or raise your hand or just ask a question, that's fine. It's not going to be disruptive to me at all. So if any of you want to just unmute yourself and ask a question at any time, feel free to do that. Okay. Um, so let's hop in and and uh, get going here. Let's see here. Why is it not? There we go. Okay. Let's, we're going to just review some high level things that we're going to go over today so that you have an idea of what you're going to come away with here over the next 60 to 90 minutes um, once we're done. Um, we're going to let you understand exactly what a mortgage is. What is an actual mortgage? When we use that term, you've heard it. What is it? Um, we're going to go over the basics of what's required for your client to get pre-approved for mortgage financing. Again, so that you understand what it is that they need so you can do some initial vetting of your clients. Um, and pre-qualification yourself. You talk to someone on the phone, you say, hey, have you had a bankruptcy in the last year? Yeah, I filed for bankruptcy last, last week. Well, that probably tells you they're not gonna have any shot of getting mortgage financing, so you don't wanna spend a whole lot of time uh, trying to help them to put them on your drip campaign instead. We're gonna go through the client experience and secure uh, financing before and after they go under contract. So again, you can visualize and in your mind understand what that process is like. We often talk about a mortgage loan like a manufacturing process. It's like an assembly line that when you build a car, you got to get the frame together before you can put the tires and the engine in and, cut and paint the car. It's the same thing with mortgage financing. It's an assembly line process, and there's certain things that have to be done, and you need to make sure you understand what that is. Uh, lastly, again, ask questions. Every one of these classes that we teach is different because you all have different uh, um, background and skills and understanding. So be sure to ask any questions because we want to make sure this is valuable and informative and helps you become that much better. All right. Uh, so again, here's the outline. What's a mortgage? Preparing for financing. What are some terms and definitions? We're going to talk about certain types of loans, potential out-of-pocket costs for your client, and then the four steps um, that you go through actually when you're through the, to get the financing in place. What are the four basic steps that the client's going to go through? And then obviously any Q&A at the end, but we can have Q&A throughout as we go through this. Okay, so what is a mortgage? Um, normally, if we were in person, I would ask you this question live and ask you to get some feedback. Um, but let's just go through what, what is an actual mortgage um, so you understand what it is. Um, a mortgage, it's, it's an actual loan. It's a physical loan that is secured against a property. Um, it's called collateral um, against the home. It's an actual loan that is secured against a property. Um, there's a financial instrument that we use to do that that's called the promissory notes. And a promissory note is an actual physical form. It's an actual piece of paper, right, um, that is attached to that property if there is a loan. And there is an owner of that promissory note. So I don't know if any of you have a mortgage right now, but if you do, you have a loan and you're making your payments to XYZ Mortgage. 
XYZ Mortgage, whoever that is, does not own your, your loan. Uh, they are the servicing company. There's someone on Wall Street or a financial investor or a hedge fund or a government or somebody that actually owns the promissory note. The prom people who own the promissory note are not the same people um, that you make your payments to. And so that promissory note can be bought and sold and traded just like a piece of stock. Um, and if you think about a piece of stock from IBM, I buy it at a certain price and I can sell it later and trade it down to somebody else if the price goes up. A promissory note is the same thing. People buy, sell, and trade promissory notes on Wall Street. That's where all loans go to live and die on Wall Street. The, the value of the home goes up. Um, it's worth more money. Um, interest rates change. That, that promissory note has a different value. So a mortgage loan has a promissory note, and that's, that's a financial instrument that you can actually buy, sell, and trade. There's two parts, as I mentioned, to the promise uh, to a loan. Um, there's the promissory note and the servicing rights. So what that means is on every mortgage, there are two pieces of documentation that somebody owns. Um, and it's never the company that actually gave them the loan. Uh, so, so what happens is, as I mentioned, the promissory note, that's who actually owns the rights to the loan. So I borrow a loan for $300,000 on a house. There's a note. An investor on Wall Street owns that promissory note. So technically owns the house. Uh, owns that promissory note to collect payment. Um, and they're going to get a return on that promissory note. They've invested. Uh, they put their money forward. It's a 3% interest rate. They're getting a 3% return on their money. They own it. And that's a piece of paper that has value. If anything were to happen, the client stopped making payments um, and they had to get foreclosed on and kicked out of the house. The person who owns the promissory note is the person that now owns that property. And they now get the property, can do whatever they want with it, sell it, get a renter, whatever they want to do, but they own that piece of property. The second piece that has value um, is called the servicing rights. And the servicing rights is the company that actually sends the monthly statements to the borrower, to the person that has their loan. So if I have a mortgage and let's say my, I have a, uh, um, a $300,000 loan, like I just said, um, and I get my monthly statements that are sent to me from say Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo and my statements say Wells Fargo, they're the ones I send my payments to. When I have questions, I call them. Wells Fargo is a huge servicer in the country, but they don't own the note, right? Someone on Wall Street owns the note. They own the servicing rights, which means the note holder has contracted with the servicing rights company to handle all front end uh, information. They're the ones that send out monthly statements, pay their taxes and insurance, ask questions, deal with foreclosure issues. They're doing all that stuff on behalf of the promissory note holder because the promissory note holder, they're just an investor. And the servicing rights has value, meaning they're getting paid on a monthly basis to do that. It's not a lot, but 25 to 50 bucks a month, they're getting paid at the monthly payment to do that for somebody. Um, and they're, the servicing companies, they're huge. They make lots of money, but that's all they do is service the loans. So that's kind of often misunderstood uh, with clients and with, with agents. The people that you make your payments to are not the people that technically own your mortgage. They're just the ones that are servicing your loan. So it's two parts to the, to, to the deal that you need to make sure you understand. Um, loans are usually amortized, meaning the payments last for over 30 years or 360 payments. Um, that's what 98% of all loans are. You can get loans in other five-year increments, so a 25, 20, 15, as low as a 10-year loan, um, but very few people do that. The lower the term, the higher the, the payment is because you're paying it off faster. Most loans are for 30 years. Uh, mortgage payments are always due the first of every month. Um, you have a 15 day grace period on mortgages. So they're considered late after the 15th. When we say late, that means the borrower is going to pay a late penalty, um, uh, usually a 5% of their principal balance, that's the principal payment in a late fee if they pay it after the 15th. Um, and then it's not considered late with the credit bureaus until they're 30 days late. So they have another 15 days after the 15th to get their payment in before it's actually reflected poorly on their credit. Once it's 30 days late, it dings their credit and really hurts their score. Again, stop me with any questions um, as we go through this, as uh, if you have any questions about what we're talking about. Welcome to some new people. We've got uh, Tracy and Kristen and Ismeray and Lars. Um, as, just as a catch up to all of you, um, if you have any questions throughout this process, unmute yourself and just ask away. That no question's a silly question. Um, you all have different levels of experience. So and you may have heard things and we wanna make sure we set the record straight on how mortgages work in the process. So make sure you're asking questions as we go through this process. Hey, yes, I have a quick question. Yeah. 
Uh, so just a, a reminder here, then whoever owns the note actually owns the loan and then whoever has the servicing rights is who you're actually paying the loan to? Correct. Okay, gotcha. Every once in a while, that could be the same, the same company, but very, very, very rarely. Uh, usually it's two different things. Whoever owns the promissory note is the owner of the mortgage. The servicing company simply collects payments, taxes, and insurance and deals with the customer interface of the client. Very rarely is that company one and the same. Nine and a half times out of 10, they're different companies. And the, as a homeowner, you will never know who's the promissory note holder because it's just not, it's not public information. It doesn't really matter uh, because that could be, uh, as I mentioned, sold many times. If any of you have had a mortgage, it's very common for someone to, I make my payment this year to Wells Fargo, then in two years, I get a notice that says, hey, your loan's been transferred to Chase. Then in three years after that, hey, your loan's been transferred to PNC. These, these loans get sold a lot um, on, this, on, on, on Wall Street. And so if the promissory note gets sold, those don't get sold as often, but if it did, it would transfer servicing companies. But servicing companies transfer their servicing rights quite often uh, because they need cash or just business, business reasons. So whenever your servicing rights change and you have, you're making your payments to a new company, the terms of the loan can't change, your monthly payment can't change, nothing changes, simply the company that you're making payments to changes. And that's very common. Great question. Okay, let's talk about um, preparing for mortgage financing. What your clients need to do to prepare for their mortgage financing. They Number one, they need to understand and be able to manage their credit properly. And we're gonna kind of go into some of the basics of that um, a little later on, but they've got to understand what their credit looks like. They need to make sure they've maintained a solid work history. Um, everything we do in lending is a, we look for the last two years of a borrower's work, employment, credit history. The last two years are the most important. Uh, we look for 10 years, but the last two years are the most important. So they've got to have a solid work history, meaning you talk to someone, you prospect, and you, they answer the phone, and you're one of the things, and they're interested, and you start pre qualifying them to some degree. Um, to see if they're a client you want to work with. One of the things you need to ask them is, hey, what's your work history like? Well, I just, you know, I was, I was unemployed the last year. I just got a job 30 days ago, so I want to get out and buy a house. That's an immediate timeout. They, they are not going to be able to get a loan right now until they're back working for at least six to 12 months. We need to see a two-year solid work history. And if there are employment gaps, that could jeopardize their ability to get a loan right now. They may have to wait a little longer. So you need to make sure you understand that it's more than just having a current job. It's what their history looks like. Uh, they need to begin to save some money um, to get the best terms and loans and rates. You've got to have a down payment, uh, look, typically at least 5%. It can be a little bit less. There are some 100% financing loans, but those are restricted per um, income and loan amount. So we don't do very many of those, but they've got to start saving some money. And as, you, as, as an FYI, these, these points are some of those pre-qualifying questions as you're prospecting and talking to clients, you're going to want to ask right? Hey, client, what's your credit look like? Do you know? What's your work situation? Have you saved any money? These are some of these pre-qualification questions you can ask clients, again, to save you from going down the primrose path of getting super excited. Hey, I got a client on the hook. I start to show them properties. I'm sending them listings. And then I find out three weeks or two weeks later that they had no shot of ever getting a loan and I just wasted a ton of time. You can do a lot of that pre-work up front just by asking some basic questions. Um, and number four, the most important thing, make sure you get them pre-approved with the mortgage lender, preferably in Spiro, before you start the home search and spending too much money. Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, super excited to work with you. Um, your time is valuable, my time is valuable. Um, I only work with pre-approved borrowers because I wanna make sure that you're, I'm doing you the best service possible and we're getting you into the right home with the right price that you can afford. Um, I require all the people I work with to get pre-approved. Here's the name of a lender you, you can talk to and they'll get you taken care of really quickly. Pretty easy discussion, pretty easy um, conversation to have. But just highly encourage you to make sure that you're getting your clients fully pre-approved before you start listing or showing properties, excuse me, and taking them out to look at homes. Again, any questions you let me know. Okay, let's go over some basic definitions and terms that you need to understand. You're going to hear some of these acronyms and terms and definitions a lot um, when you're speaking with a mortgage company. And you're gonna be talking to mortgage companies because you know your client's gonna get pre-approved with somebody. 
then that loan officer is going to reach out to you and say, hey, the Smiths are pre-approved. They're good to go for a $400,000 loan amount. They need to get FHA financing. Uh, they have 5% to put down. Um, and here's what things look like. And they're going to start throwing out some terms and definitions that you need to make sure you understand. Um, so you have a you can have a, a, an educated conversation with that loan officer, not only then, but throughout the process. Um, number one, LTV, loan to value. Loan to value means how much of a loan the borrower is taking in relationship to the purchase price. So just for easy math, if someone is buying a $100,000 house, those don't exist, but let's just for the sake of today's discussion, someone's buying a $100,000 house and they put 5% down, so they're putting $5,000 down, that means their loan to value is 95%, okay? So the loan to value is however much of a loan they're securing in relationship to the purchase price is called loan to value. And that's important because there are guidelines, loan to value guidelines for all the different types of loans that are out there. APR, you've seen this probably a lot, annual percentage rate. This is a federally required rate that you have to disclose as a financing company on any type of loan anybody gets, whether it's a house, a car, a credit card, a student loan, doesn't matter, an annual percentage rate. The APR is not the rate that a loan payment is calculated on. That's the basic interest rate. What an APR does, it discloses what the actual cost in terms of a rate are to the borrower. What that means is getting a loan is not free. There are fees and costs associated with that loan. And so what happens is you take the borrower's loan amount, you add those fees back on top of it, and then amortize it over 30 years to come up with a new interest rate called the APR that shows them how much it costs. The idea is that if, if two companies are competing on a loan and they both have the exact same interest rate, the company that has a higher APR is charging more closing costs. That's theoretical what it's supposed to do. It doesn't always do that. Um, and it's super confusing and it to be honest, it doesn't really help a whole lot, but it's a federal requirement and you're going to see it. So you need to understand what APR is, but just know that it's not the borrower's interest rate um, that they're getting on their mortgage. That's simply a numerical representation of what the cost, closing costs are on the loan. Again, stop me with any questions if we need to go into any of these things further, okay? Um, PMI versus MIP stands for private mortgage insurance or mortgage insurance premium. They both mean the same thing. They're just two different ways of saying the same thing um, based on whether it's a conventional loan or an FHA loan. And we'll talk about the differences there. What that means is anytime a buyer does not put at least 20% down on a house, on a down payment, they have to have something called mortgage insurance. And mortgage insurance is basically, it does not insure you, it does not insure the borrower, it doesn't insure anybody involved in the transaction other than the lending company giving the loan. It ensures the lending company given the loan in case that borrower were to ever default and foreclose on their house. Um, if you put less than 20% down on a house, you're much more likely to default and go into foreclosure than if you put more than 20%, because if you put more than 20% down, that's a big chunk of change. You're going to do whatever you have to do to make the payment. So federal guidelines dictate that if you don't put 20% down, you have to have mortgage insurance. And that mortgage insurance premium is based on a bunch of factors, but the two terms are interchangeable. You just need to know what they are. DTI stands for debt to income ratio. We're going to go over, I'll show you an example of that later, so we won't spend too much time right here, but just DTI stands for debt to income ratio. It's a reflection of how much debt they have in comparison to their monthly income. Hazard insurance premium, also known as your homeowner's insurance, um, but in the insurance world, they call it hazard insurance. That's the insurance policy on your house. You must have an insurance policy on your house that protects you, the borrower and the lender from loss of any kind. Points, you'll hear the word points. It also means discount points. What that is, is that is a fee that the lending company is charging to get a lower interest rate. As I mentioned before, there are closing costs, origination costs to get a loan. Uh, they're pretty standard for most places. Uh, they, don't, they vary slightly, maybe a few hundred dollars here and there. And Spiro is very competitive and on the low end side. Um, credit unions and actual brick and mortar banks like Chase or Wells Fargo charge more. Um, independent mortgage companies, independent mortgage banks, which is what Inspira was, which we do. Independent mortgage banks do about 80% of all the loans in the country. Um, credit unions and banks and brokers do kind of the rest. But uh, if 
there's fees to do a loan, as I mentioned, they're pretty standard. But if a borrower wants to get a lower rate than the actual going rate, they can actually do that. So if rates today are say three and a half percent, if they really want a 3% rate, they can, it's called buying the rate down. They can, and, and you do that with discount points and there's a fee associated with it. It's very expensive, uh, but you'll hear that a lot. Some companies charge discount points on all the loans they do, not advisable. We don't do that, uh, but you'll hear that term and need to understand what it means. ARM stands for an adjustable rate mortgage uh, compared to a fixed rate mortgage. Again, most mortgages are fixed. So the rate of three and a half percent is the same for the full 30 years of the loan. It never changes, uh, but you can get an adjustable rate mortgage, which means the loan adjusts every year after a certain fixed period of time. Uh, not, we don't do hardly any of those because fixed rate mortgages are very, very low and probably lower than the, the adjustable rate mortgage. We used to do a lot of adjustable rate mortgages 15, 20 years ago when there was a big discrepancy between the two, um, or if someone was only going to be in the house for a short period of time, then it made, made sense. But you, you likely will never run across this, but you just need to know what it means. An LE versus a CD, this is important. Uh, these are two documents that by law we have to disclose to the clients um, at the time of origination and then right before they close. And they're the same documents. They just have, uh, they look exactly the same. They show the same information. Um, the, the name difference just has to do with at what point in the process we're providing it. A loan estimate is, is, is just exactly that. It's an estimate of the interest rate, the loan terms, the cost of a loan at the time the client applies for a mortgage. But we have to give them an estimate of what we look, we think their loan payment's gonna be, how, what are the closing costs, even though we may not have a lot of this information yet, we have to estimate what it is and provide that to them within three days of when they've applied for a mortgage loan. That loan estimate can change once we have more information. Uh, for example, we typically don't know at the time of the loan estimate exactly what their insurance premium is. We don't know what their property taxes are quite yet. Um, so there's some variables that we don't know. We don't know exactly when they're closing yet. So there's a bunch of stuff we don't know, but we estimate on that document. The closing disclosure is something we have to provide to the client at least three days before they sign their documents. Um, and now at that point, this is two, three, four weeks later, we have things pretty much buttoned down and we know exactly what things are going to be like. And we're required by law to re-disclose and show the client what those fees and costs are so that that way they are prepared for when they go to the closing table and sign what everything's like so there aren't any surprises. So the LE and the CD are things that we have to send the client uh, to make sure that they're informed. Origination is that, again, a fee that I mentioned to you before um, that is different than a discount point. Origination fees are just standard fees that we have to charge a client to get the loan uh, to, to process, underwritten, and closed. With Inspiro, that fee, just so you know, is $1,390, so $1,390. Um, fees vary usually anywhere from a thousand to two thousand dollars. We're on the lower end. You probably see most origination charges um, in the in the high fifteen, sixteen, seventeen hundred range. Escrow. Escrow means two different things, um, and you need that uh, in in California. Utah means just one thing. Um, in both states, an escrow account talks about the taxes and insurance that are in a borrower's monthly payment that are gonna be collected every month and then paid out on an annual basis. So a borrower in their monthly payment, part of their payment is gonna consist of the proper, one twelfth of the property taxes and one twelfth of the homeowner's insurance that's being collected every month, put in what's called an escrow account. And then every year, the mortgage servicing company they make their payments to pays their insurance company and pays the state for taxes on what the amount that is owed. That's called an escrow account. Um, and you're required to have that if you don't put a certain amount down on your house. You can waive that and not have an escrow account if a borrower wants to pay their taxes and insurance themselves. Um, most people don't, but they have that option. So that's what an escrow account means, and that's the same across the country. The term going un into escrow is a California term in some other states where when you actually go under contract and provide earnest money to an escrow company. So if you have any uh, California loan uh, agents here, you'll know what escrow is. That does not apply to Utah loans. There is no going into escrow in Utah, but there is in California. When you go under contract, you provide your earnest money to the escrow company and you open escrow with, with an escrow uh, insurance provider in California. Locking, well, uh, an interest rate 
interest rates are living, moving, breathing things. They change all the time. And at some point in the mortgage process, preferably at the beginning, we lock in the rate. So it doesn't matter what the market does, they are guaranteed that rate. We lock in at three and a half percent. Tomorrow, if it goes to 3.625 or 3.7, they're safe at three and a half percent. But conversely, if tomorrow it goes down to three and a quarter, they don't get to lower their rate. They lock that rate in. Um, we do a good job of advising clients on when to lock. Um, you're locked for a certain amount of time, um, meaning usually for 30 to 45 days. So you want to get the loan closed within that time period, but it locks them in. So it takes all the stress out of what's happening in the market. We are in a rising interest rate environment right now, the first time in a long over a decade. So many of you on the call have never seen a plus 4% interest rate, which is still great, but we're likely heading that direction, um, which is okay. There's going to still be tons of people buying because of lack of inventory. Uh, but we are in a rising interest rate environment. So we are advising our clients to lock in as soon as possible once they're under contract and not, not wait around. PITI, these are the four main points of a borrower's monthly payment. A borrower's monthly payment consists of the principal you're paying back on the loan, the interest based on the interest rate, and then your property taxes and homeowner's insurance. Uh, there's a fifth component, mortgage insurance, if you have to have it. So there'd actually be... Uh, P-I-T-I-M, M-I, but typically it's P-I-T-I, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance that consists of a borrower's monthly payment. The principal interest portion of a borrower's monthly payment never changes over 30 years. It's locked in at the interest rate. However, the taxes and insurance will change because taxes and insurance go up every month. As a result, a, a, result, a borrower's payment will likely increase every single year nominally to account for the rise in taxes and insurance. So this year, my payment may be $2,000, but if my taxes go up 300 bucks, my payment has to adjust accordingly next year to make sure that the mortgage company can pay enough, has enough in the escrow account to pay it. So that's why borrower's payments go up a little bit, even though their principal and interest portion stays the same, the total payment increases because the taxes and insurance go up. Chris? Yeah. Can I just ask, um, sorry, I didn't catch in quick enough, but on locking, how uh -huh. early can you lock for like a construction loan? And are there different times for, for conventional and FHA and that? Yep, great question. Um, I'll, you, uh, I'll, I'll lock, to lock a loan, you have to have a couple things. You have to have an actual borrower's name and their information, and you have to have a home associated with it, meaning an address. I can't just lock in a rate without a house attached to that lock. You've got to have both of them. So you can lock the second that the client is under contract um, on a home. Um, now we're not to put construction aside, but on a regular house, the second they go under contract and they wanna move forward with the financing, we can lock in that loan right away. Um, so immediately um, to protect their interests. Um, and it doesn't matter what type of loan it is, whether it's a conventional FHA, USDA, VA, makes no difference what kind of loan they get, we can lock in right away. Construction financing is different uh, because when you get a, to, to, when you do a construction, there's two loans you have to get. You have to actually get a construction loan to build the house, at which and that loan is in place for six to twelve months. Uh, as you build the house, it can be longer if it's a bigger house, um, and that loan um, gets locked in at the time again you're ready to actually secure the financing on the construction piece. You can't lock the long-term finance, then the second part of the construction is you have to get a, a regular loan to pay off the construction loan. So you have to get two loans when you do a construction, a construction loan, and then we call it permanent financing. And you can't lock in the rate on permanent financing until you're closer to being done with the house. Um, and so that you do have some risk there when you're doing a construction loan. You haven't had that for the last five years because rates have been flat or going lower but you will have that risk here in this next year. So if you have clients that are going out and getting a construction loan to buy a new house, um, they're not gonna be able to lock in their permanent financing until later in the year when the house is getting closer to being done because a lock is usually only good for 30 to 60 days, typically 30 to 45 days. Um, so they can't lock until the house is 30 to 45 days from being done and rates could be higher then. Now you can lock for a longer period of time you do have the ability to lock for six months to 12 months on the long-term financing, but it is super expensive. It costs thousands of upfront dollars for the borrower. Um, and often it's wasted money because you're locking in on something that you don't know rates are going to be like. So 
I can talk to you more offline if you have questions about it, but it's, um, it's a little bit dicey right now. If you're having someone that's doing a construction loan uh, and building something as far as their interest rate, the rate that they may ultimately get when the house is done in six to 12 months is likely going to be very different than what rates are today because you can't lock in that rate. But great We're, question. Yeah, that is for clients, but also personal. And just to tell the people that are a little newer on this, because I'm not only older, but um, I've been in for a few years. Uh, I know that the rates are going up, but don't be alarmed. In 1999, I bought a house for 10.5%. Now it was only seven and a half, but because I paid all my debt off, they said, oh, you don't have any credit. So by the time the new home was built, they raised it 3%, which was a lot. So if it goes up to four, I don't care if it's four and a half, if it's under five, I'm like, good deal. You know, like buy the house. So. Yeah, great point, Tracy, thank you. It's, and I, Again, most of you that are on this call that are, are new or that are younger, you, you've never seen a rate above 4%. Um, and because the last 10 plus years, rates have been so low and constantly going down. Um, there, there will be a few bar, buyers that will go to the sideline because they think, oh my gosh, rates are 3.5%. Oh my gosh, rates are 3.75%. they are so high. I'm going to wait for them to come down. That is not advisable um, because they may never get back down to sub 3% like they were the last 18 months. Um, that was, those were once in a lifetime, lowest ever on record uh, interest rates. And really any rate below 7% is historically super good. Now we haven't been above 7% in 20 years, um, but I like you Trace, the first home I bought was a 10 and percent back in the nineties. Um, and I was happy with it. So people, people need housing, regardless of what interest rates are, they need housing. And whether rates are 2% or 4% or 5%, when people wanna buy, they wanna buy. Um, and that, it, the rate is what it is. And for someone to get on the sideline right now to say, hey, you know, rates were at 2.99% three months ago or six months ago, I'm gonna wait for them to get back down to that. that that's All a right. losing strategy. They're gonna, they're gonna likely end up with a higher rate than they would otherwise. Not only that, prices are going to continue to rise. So any possible savings they may have seen by a slightly you know, lower rate is offset by they just paid $50,000 more for that exact same house by waiting six to 12 months. So really educate your clients on the history of interest rates, on why buying now is so critical and important. Um, you know, we're not, we may see a little bit less of an appreciation. You know, this last year was a historic year for appreciation, appreciation and values. But both California and Utah, it, we are not slowing down as far as housing need um, and people needing new homes. We are just so far behind what is needed from a supply uh, standpoint that prices are not going to all of a sudden drop um, and all of a sudden you're going to get this amazing deal. So we can help you with any of that kind of that kind of uh, finance speak if you need to, or also just talk to your clients to advise them if you ever need that. Okay, FHA and VA. We'll talk about some different loan types here in a minute. Um, but FHA stands for Federal Housing Administration and VA stands for Veterans Administration. These are government insured or government sponsored loans versus what's called a conventional loan. We'll talk about the difference here in a minute. But just the acronym FHA and VA, you need to know what that means. FHA, Federal Housing Loan, anyone can get that. It's really designed for first time home buyers particularly, but anyone can secure that. VA, Veterans Administration, that's only for people that are current active military or were in the military at some point to get a VA loan. All right, let's jump right into that so we, you understand a little bit more about what the differences is, are on these loans. Okay, conventional loan. Conventional loans account for the vast majority of loans that are secured in the, in the country. All loans have underwriting and standards and criteria. They're all basically the same on how they work, um, but they are backed and secured and sponsored for, uh, differently. A conventional loan is a private market loan, meaning it's a loan that's, as I mentioned, bought, sold, and traded on Wall Street. Um, investors own conventional loans, and 70 plus percent of all loans are conventional loans. Um, conventional loans have different, a few different restrictions or guidelines based on your down payment requirement. To get a down, conventional loans, you typically have to have at least 5% 
You can do on the three, but it has income restrictions. So typically you have to have at least 5% in the down payment to get a conventional loan. Um, it is a private market loan, meaning bought, sold, and traded on Wall Street with investors that own that promissory note. Conventional loans have loan limits. Um, and the national loan limit just changed in January to 647,200. That's the, that's the case for every county in, in the country has that, that loan limit. Now there are some um, counties that are called high cost counties across the country uh, that are, uh, they're given a boost. For example, you can see there, if you have anyone from California on a call, you know, we're, we're in Ventura um, down there. The Ventura conventional loan limit is 850,000. So almost $200,000 higher than the national conventional loan limit um, because it's considered a high cost and houses are just more expensive. So in Utah, um, or if you're in Salt Lake City, um, you, can't, you, you can't borrow more than 647,000 if you wanna get a conventional loan. Now Park City, Heber, Wasatch County, they're, all, they're like Ventura, you can go up to eight, 900,000, but most counties in Salt Lake are 647 too. Uh, there are some counties called high cost counties where you get a high balance conforming limit and go up a little bit higher. A little bit confusing, I know, but just use that 647.2 as a good number to have in your head for what the, the loan limit is. Doesn't mean the purchase price, you can buy whatever you want, just meaning how much you can actually borrow in a loan um, is 647.2. FHA, as we said before, stands for Federal Housing Administration. Those are federally insured loans. Um, they're also still bought and sold on Wall Street, but the difference is, is the federal government guarantees and insures them. So if there's a loss, the mortgage company is, gets paid back by the government. On conventional loans, if we, if we have to foreclose on someone, we're out money. We lose money. We have to try to recapture it some other way when we sell the property. On FHA, if someone gets foreclosed on, the federal government actually, it's like an insurance policy, pays the lender a fee. Um, a, a return for that loss. And the reason is, is FHA was designed to help promote home ownership of this country. Um, and so FHA loans are awesome. They do have some restrictions on income. Um, you can see the loan limits are smaller than conventional loan limits. They are county specific. So you can see in Utah, these main three counties, the, the, the loan limits are totally different. In Ventura, it's still the same. It matches the conventional but the loan limits are very different county to county across the whole country when it comes to FHA. FHA only requires the bar to put three and a half percent down on a, versus five percent on conventional. They're a little bit more flexible with guidelines, with credit scores, with your ability, you know, your work history, which again is why they're designed for first time home buyers, but anyone can get them. Um, a first time home buyer is defined as someone who hasn't secured a loan in the last three years. Um, that's just what the definition means. Doesn't mean they've never bought one, but anyone can get an FHA loan, uh, but they're designed to help people get into them and with a little bit looser guidelines, but the loan amounts are smaller. The down payment requirement is smaller. Again, stop me if you have any questions. I'm going kind of fast, but just let me know if you have questions about these. VA, as we mentioned before, stands for Veterans Administration. It's only available for veterans or current active military uh, people in, in the military. Uh, the nice thing about VA is twofold. Number one, there really isn't any loan limit. They can get almost kind of any loan they want so long as they qualify for it. And the other thing is VA is a 100% financing loan. You do not have to have any down payment to get a VA. Um, VA is designed as a benefit for our veterans. They should. They should have every benefit we can possibly throw at them. So VA has fantastic interest rates. The mortgage insurance premium on VA is lower than conventional FHA and you don't have to put any money down. So if you, it's one of the first questions we always ask someone, hey, are you a veteran or, or currently serving? Because if they are, we definitely wanna let them know about VA financing because it usually um, makes sense for them to secure that. Jumbo, a jumbo loan is a private market loan and it's any loan that's over the conventional loan limit, okay? Unless you're in a high balance conforming county, so in Utah, for example, any loan that was over 647,000 would be considered a jumbo loan. But in Ventura County, the loan would have to be over 851,000 before it was considered a jumbo loan. Uh, jumbo loans are um, much more challenging to secure. They're much more strict because the larger the loan limit, the greater the risk to the lending company. Mortgage financing is about a four letter word, R-I-S-K, risk. Everything is based on risk. Um, and the more risky a loan is, the stricter the lending guidelines are, the higher the interest rates. It's all about the risk that that borrower is going to foreclose or not make their payment. And because general loans are so much larger than standard loans, 
the guidelines are more strict. You usually have to put at least 10 to 25% down to get a really good interest rate. Um, you have to have much higher credit scores. You have to have more money in reserves after you've made your down payment. Your job history is going to be looked at more strictly. It's much, much harder to secure a jumbo loan than these other three loan types, and they take longer. Um, so you just want to be aware that if you ever get a nice, big, juicy house, a million dollar house that you're listing, um, it, uh, you're the listing agent, know that the people buying it may take them a little bit longer to secure financing. But on the other side, if you have a client that's in that jumbo market looking to buy a house that's a high price tag, once they get under contract, it's going to take a little longer. Typically, we say plan on 45 to 60 days. These other loans, we can get them done within in less than 30 days. We average about 23 days to get our loans done. Uh, conventional FHA, you can plan on about just 30 day contract to be safe. Jumbo, you typically want to write a 45 to 60 day contract because they just take longer. Non-QM stands for non-qualified mortgage. These are what your, your non-traditional portfolio loans. Not super common, but they're still out there. And what that means is these are the kind of loans where people don't qualify for any of these other categories due to credit scores, job history, down payment. Typically, non-QM loans we do for people that are self-employed because a lot of self-employed borrowers do not report the actual income that they make, which they have that right to do. That's one of the advantages of being self-employed. So you'll have someone that makes $300,000 a year, but because of all their write-offs, uh, their tax returns show they make $50,000 a year. Well, we have to go off as a lender what their tax returns show when they're a self-employed borrower. Not what they actually take home, but what they report on their taxes. So... Um, as a result, a lot of self-employed borrowers can't qualify for traditional loans because they're underreporting their income. But there are non-traditional loans that allow us to qualify them based off of other things that we look at, like deposits in their bank account. So we don't do a lot of these. They're available. You may hear about them now and again, but you just need to be aware of what they are. Again, we talked about fixed rate versus adjustable mortgages previously. Most loans are going to be fixed over the 30 years. They're not going to adjust. And we want to mention these three federal agencies. Um, these are really funny names. You may never have seen these before, and they kind of rhyme. But Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginny Mae. The federal government, uh, it's called the FHFA, Federal Housing Finance Administration. They are a government agency that sets all lending guidelines. And about 60 years ago, the federal government set up two private entities called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to help liquidate and provide liquidity in the market so that loans could be bought, sold, and traded on Wall Street. Before these entities were set up, mortgage loans were not bought and sold and traded on Wall Street. Up until the late 60s, early 70s, if you wanted to buy a house, the only way you could buy a house is you had to have a personal relationship with your local bank or, um, and know the guy there and have at least 10 to 20% down, and that bank would own and hold your mortgage loan forever, right, for the whole 30 years. Um, and so there was no liquidity in the market. If a local bank didn't have money to lend for housing, it was hard to get a loan. Um, it was hard to know if someone qualified. I mean, it, 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 there was not a lot of liquidity. So home ownership in this country was sub 50%. It was in the 30, 40% range. When the federal government got involved and provided liquidity and lending guidelines and standardizations and a secondary market on Wall Street where loans could be bought and sold and traded, home ownership jumped over 60%. We've always, and we've kind of maintained that. Um, home ownership in this rate, 63% of all Americans own their house or have a mortgage. Um, and that's what Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginny Mae do. They are these agencies that are private, but still controlled by the federal government that make guidelines um, that we have to follow for conventional and government financing. And you may hear these terms every once in a while. Any questions on these types of loans before we go to the next slide? You're all doing great. Hope you're getting something out of it. Um, learning, taking notes uh, to make you a better agent. All right, let's talk about some potential out-of-pocket expenses for your client um, so that you can, as you vet them out, you can see if they have these. Number one, as we mentioned, you typically need to have a down payment, um, minimum of 3%, but most conventional loans are three are 5% and FHA is three and a half, but the more, the better. Um, Tracy Sierra said, can we get slides for this? Yes, we can definitely send out slides so that you have these. Uh, the more money you put down, the better. The better the interest rate, typically, the more you put down, the, the less risk it is for the loan. Um, as I mentioned before, there are some 100% financing loans. California, you can kind of forget about that. 
uh, you're not going to be able to get any 100% financing because 100% financing loans are called uh, bond loans or down payment assistant loans. And they have income restrictions as well as loan amount purchase price restrictions. And those restrictions are so strict that there is not a house in Southern California that you'd be able to buy to get a 100% uh, financing likely. In Utah, there's something called Utah Housing. Um, and there still are some homes out there that you could qualify for some of with 100% financing. Uh, the terms aren't as good, but sometimes that's the only option. Um, but as I mentioned, nine and a half times out of 10, you want your clients to have a down payment and then you need to ask them if they do. Closing costs, there are always costs associated with the loan, as I mentioned before. Typically anywhere from one to 3% of the purchase price for closing costs. That includes the lender fees, plus title and escrow and insurance fees that we don't control. We have nothing to do with it. You have to have. Um, when, you, uh, when the buyer has to bring that to closing in addition to their down payment, unless you can negotiate that the sellers pay that, that for them. Down payment cannot be paid for by a seller. Uh, down payment can be gifted to a buyer from a family member or relative. Uh, if they don't have it, uh, that's okay. But um, closing costs can be paid for by the seller. A seller cannot pay for the down payment, but the seller can help pay for some or all of closing costs. Um, as you go under contract, there are going to be some inspections that you're going to want to have the borrower do, as well as we're going to require an appraisal they're going to have to get. Appraisals cost anywhere from five to $700. Um, it, they pay for that when they actually close. It's financed into the, into the deal. But inspections is something they're going to have to pay for up front. Typically, when you go under contract, you want your buyer to have a, a property inspection from a professional that's going to come out and inspect the property. Those cost anywhere from five, excuse me, three to five hundred dollars. Typically, um, we have nothing to do with it. It's something that's totally separate, but it's the best thing you can do because you want that inspector to, to catch if there's a foundation, a roof, a structural, uh, electrical, plumbing issue. Because if there's something that's too major, they're not going to want to buy the house. Uh, but that's something they're going to have to pay for separately. You need to prepare them for but they have to pay at the time the service is completed. As I mentioned, down payment can be gifted. And as I mentioned, there are DPA stands for down payment assistant programs that will help with the down payment so that a borrower can get 100% financing. But yet again, there are income restrictions and there are loan amount restrictions that make it harder to do these days. Okay. Um, now we've kind of given you some background and some understanding of how mortgages work and terminology. Now we want to go through what that process looks like for your client. When, once you tell them, hey, I need you to go get pre-approved before we start looking at a house and start making offers on houses, let's get you uh, set up. Now, there is a difference between a pre-approval and a pre-qualification. We want to make sure you understand what that is. Um, before we do, let's talk about one of the things that we look at um, when we do see if someone can qualify for a house. Number one is we're going to look at their credit score. Um, you've got to have a credit score. Um, to be able to get a financing, the higher your credit score, the better interest rates you will get. Um, credit scores range between 350 and 850. We don't ever see anything that extreme on either end. Um, typically, the highest credit score we see is around 800, and the lowest credit score we'll ever see is about 500. In order to secure conventional mortgage financing, you have to have at least a 620 FICO score or credit score. It's the same thing. Um, you have to have, have at least a 620 credit score to secure traditional conventional financing. Um, to secure jumbo financing, you know, a jumbo loan, you typically have to have at least a 700 plus credit score. To secure government financing, which is FHA or VA or USDA, you could go down to 600 and sometimes down to 580. But Remember, on all these loan products, the lower the score, the higher your interest rate. And you, it's pretty severe. So a conventional borrower um, has a low credit score of, say, 640, could have an interest rate that's a quarter to half a percent higher for the exact same house versus someone that has a credit score of 760. Um, and so that's why having a credit score is so critical. We do a lot of credit education for clients to help them with their credit scores. The higher your score, the better your interest rate. Your credit consists of five different things. Um, we talked to clients about this, and we have us teach a separate class on credit alone that you ought to all participate in when we get a chance to teach it again, that really dives into detail more about credit scores, how they work, how to manipulate it to some degree, uh, how to make sure you have an optimal score. 
But here are the five things that determine what your score is. Think of it kind of like a syllabus or how do I get an A in the class? This is how you get an A in a class. This is how you get an A on your credit score. Number one, your 35% of your credit score is based off of your payment history. Do you pay your stuff on time? Yes or no? Are you late? Yes or no? Do you have judgments, foreclosures, bankruptcies? Yes or no? Um, and it makes sense. Someone that has a good payment history that pays their stuff on time should be rewarded and their credit score should be heavily weighed towards that payment history. So that one's pretty black and white. The next section that accounts for 30% of your credit score has to do with how much do you owe on revolving accounts, meaning credit cards. You do have to have some credit cards um, on your credit score to have an optimal score, meaning a score above 700. To get the best rates, we like to see people with credit scores above a 740 or a 760. Um, there are all kinds of things you can do to make sure you're in that range, but um, you, you do have to have some credit card accounts. You don't have debt on them. You need to have a few credit card accounts to, to get credit for this 30% of your credit score. Um, and what that means is we look to see how much do you owe on those credit cards in relationship to what your limit is. So if your limit on a credit card is for easy numbers is $1,000 and you owe two, 200, that means you have like at the debt ratio, you, you, you're maximizing about 20% of your credit um, limit. The second you owe more than 50% of your credit limit um, on your credit card, your score starts to go down because of risk factors. Um, once you owe more than 70% of your credit card limit, your scores start to really go down. And that's if you maintain a balance for more than three months of that amount. So we tell clients, hey, listen, you have credit cards. It's okay to have some balances on there, but you need to make sure you owe below 20% of your credit card limit for at least three months before you go into getting securing financing, because otherwise it's going to impact your score. Um, the reason why that accounts for such a big part of your credit is um, credit cards, it's the one thing that you have that can show how do you manage free money given to you. If you have a mortgage or a car or student loan or whatever, you got to pay back whatever it is every month. It doesn't change. Either you pay it or you don't. But a credit card, you can use and pay off as much as you want. And it's a way for the credit bureaus to see how do you manage your money. Um, and so that's why it accounts for such a big percentage of your score. 15% of your credit score has to do with how long you've had credit. So a young person is not going to have as good of a score as a 40 or 50 year old person just because they haven't had as much credit history. Remember, credit and mortgages are all about risk. If you haven't had a long credit profile, how do I know how risky it is to give you a loan because you don't have a history for me to look at? Um, fourth thing is new credit. Are you opening and closing accounts a lot? How many new accounts do you have? Uh, opening and closing accounts regularly actually hurts your score because it shows instability. Um, and so how much new credit you have or it's open in the last 12 to 24 months accounts for 10% of your score. And then the types of credit you have, we talk about breadth and depth, meaning the more diverse your credit is of car loans, student loans, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the more history we have, the more we can tell uh, your score is going to be impacted by those accounts. Um, that accounts for 10% of your, your, uh, your score. Now this, this stuff doesn't mean we want people to go into debt. That's the last thing we want to do. Um, and some people live on a cash method, meaning they don't do anything other than cash and they don't have any credit. And as awesome as that is and financially sound as that is, that's also a death sentence when it comes to getting a loan. If you don't have any credit, you are not going to be able to secure mortgage financing. You must have at least a 24 month credit profile to be able to get a loan. Um, we oftentimes get people that have, don't have any credit accounts whatsoever because they've always lived with cash. Now that happens less than it used to, but we used to get it all the time. Um, and we'd have to tell them, hey, we're not, you're not going to be able to get a loan anywhere because there's no way for us to determine the risk factor of you paying back this mortgage loan because you don't, you've never had a loan. And so there's no way for us to know. So that's one of the things that we educate clients on. And sometimes we have to put a game plan in place for them to help them with that. But these are the five things that determine your credit score. And it's super critical when it comes to um, what someone qualifies for. Any questions about credit so far? All right. The next thing we're going to look at um, in getting someone qualified and approved is their income. Uh, we need to make sure we have a complete two-year job history, meaning they could have changed jobs over two years. That's fine. But we want to see that they've had, we prefer to not have any gaps in that two-year history. Uh, if they do, and it was a short gap, or they changed jobs and they took a week off before starting a new job, that's okay. But once we start seeing job gaps of more than 30 days, we have to have explanations for that. 
And if we start to see job gaps of more than three months, we may, it may be required that they have a longer work history. We may have to look more than two years. It may need to be a three-year work history. Um, so job history is super important when we look at, at income. Uh, some of the things we're going to request from the borrowers to determine what their income looks like, because we have to determine exactly what their monthly income is, is we're going to ask to see their last 30 days of pay stubs. <clears throat> we're going to ask to see their tax returns, uh, their W-2s, their 1099s, their K-1s. If they're self-employed, we're going to ask to see their corporate tax returns. We need to have a complete profile of how much this borrower makes or how much they declare in taxes to determine how much income we can count uh, for their qualification. Now we're going to get back to the why, how the income impacts the debt to income ratio. We brought that up before of what a debt to income ratio is. The first thing we look at with mortgages is what is your credit score look like? Number two, do you have a job and are you working? Number three is a debt to income ratio. Debt to income ratio determines how much a client can qualify for. So let's show an example of exactly what that means. Let's say someone makes $10,000 a month. We've got all their income documentation and we've verified that they make $10,000 a month. We've then pulled their credit, so that's good. Great, check. We've then pulled their credit and their credit scores are good. And we can see they have multiple accounts um, on their uh, credit profile the credit report, I should say. They have a car loan, they have some student loans, they have credit cards um, that amount to maybe $1,000 a month. And then they wanna buy a house that's gonna cost $1,500 a month. So their total monthly payments, uh, when, if we were to secure a loan for them between their house, new house payment and all the debts on their credit amount to $2,500 a month. That means their debt ratio is 25%. We divide the $2,500 a month payments, so payments on their credit report plus the new house payment, we divide that by their gross monthly income to get a debt ratio. Um, on conventional financing, we don't like to see debt ratios above 42%, kind of a funny number, but 42% is kind of a magic number. We can sometimes go up into the mid to high 40% on conventional loans if they have great credit and they're putting a ton of money down, but typically they will not get an approval uh, and they won't get approved if their debt ratios are above 42%. On FHA and VA, we can go much higher. We can oftentimes go above 50% debt ratio. So in this example here, someone could have a total monthly payment of $5,000 a month and still qualify for FHA or VA. Jumbo, the requirement's even lower, uh, what the debt ratio can be. Um, so debt ratio, this is what, how we determine how much a borrower qualifies for. We just kind of play with the numbers, the loan amounts to say, this is, you, this is how we can say you qualify for a $300,000 loan versus a $400,000 loan. The debt ratio determines that. <clears throat> as I said, we'd like to see debt ratios below 40%. The lower the debt ratio, the better the interest rate as well. Um, and again, this just talks about the different things that a mortgage payment consists of that go into factoring the, month, the total monthly payment. Any questions about debt ratios? Sorry, can you repeat the conventional? You said the conventional was 42%, FHA 50%, Yeah, right? 40, Yeah, and they're, they're not exact, right? They're yeah, more or less. A lot of variables depending on the client's unique situation. But in mm -hmm. general, 42% for uh, conventional loans, you can often go up to 50, sometimes even 55% on FHA or VA. Um, in fact, we even did, we even had a, so VA there is the most loose. We even had a VA loan recently that had an 80% debt ratio and we did it, which is crazy. 80% of their, of their payments were going out the door just for basic stuff. That's very unusual. Uh, but typically con conventional loans, 42%. FHA VA is about 50%. Jumbo loans, sub 40%. Typically about 35% debt ratio on jumbo loans. Okay, thanks. Good question. Any others? All right, debt ratios. Let's talk about the documentation items that you'll need to get pre-approved or pre-qualified. And again, we're gonna come back and say, tell you what the difference is on this. Um, you're gonna need, we have, we have, you're not you, we're gonna request from your clients when you send them our way to get uh, approved. Income, we gotta get all their basic income documentations, pay stubs, W-2s, tax returns, et cetera. Assets, where's the money coming from for the down payment? We gotta verify they actually have money for a down payment. So we're gonna get their bank statements, their investment accounts, their retirement accounts, or if they're getting money gifted to them from a family member, we have to get their family member's bank accounts to verify that their family member has it. 
A, borrow, a client cannot go borrow money for a down payment. They can't go to a bank and get a loan for their 5% down payment. That doesn't work. It has to be actual liquid funds that they've saved or getting, giving gift, gifted to them. If they have been divorced at any time in their life, we have to get a copy of their divorce decree. Well, why do I got to get it? That seems strange. Well, the reason is we have to get a copy of the divorce decree to see are they obligated to make any payments? Do they have to pay anybody any alimony or child support? Reason being is, let's go back to this previous slide. I have to add that amount into this monthly debt payment because alimony and child support payments do not appear on credit reports. But if someone's obligated to pay $500 in alimony and child support payments, I have to add that payment in their debt ratios. So I have to verify whether they have that in a divorce decree. Divorce decrees are public information. And we'll, if they lie to us or tell us they weren't divorced, we will find out that they are. <laughs> you'll, you'll find out that a mortgage lender, we have to dive really deep into someone's personal life, which, which is why everything is so private. Um, and we will know from based on public records whether someone was divorced. And if they tell us they weren't, and we find out later they were, and we have to get a copy of the divorce decree, and we find out they're obligated on $1,000 a month in child support, um, and we qualified them previously without it, and now that child support payment makes it so they don't qualify, that's not a good discussion for anybody to have. It's the borrower's fault for not telling us, but those are the things that we try to vet out up front um, with the client. Uh, also, bankruptcy if a client has ever had a bankruptcy in the last seven years, it doesn't matter what kind of, there's all kinds of different bankruptcies, chapter seven, chapter uh, 11, chapter 13, there's all kinds of bankruptcies. Um, we have to get those discharge papers to see, again, if they're obligated on anything or how long it's been. There is a time restriction from the time someone has filed bankruptcy before they can get a loan and they're different. Um, for conventional loans, it's typically depending on the type of bankruptcy, it's anywhere from four to seven years before they could qualify for a mortgage after they've uh, had a bankruptcy discharge. Uh, for FHA, it's anywhere from two to four years, depending on how long the bankruptcy has been in place. Um, so we have to know what kind of bankruptcy they had and how long it's been to see whether they qualify for a loan, depending on what type of loan they're getting. And then we're gonna ask for their ID. Um, you have to be a US citizen or someone with a working visa that's authorized to be here to get a loan. We cannot give a loan to a foreign national that lives in France and wants to buy a house in the United States. They'd have to get a loan in France to do that. If they don't have a social security number, pay taxes here, work here, or have a work visa to be here. Or if it's an undocumented um, worker, you know, someone that came to the United States illegally with no documentation, we can't get them a loan either. So we're going to ask for, if they're a U.S. citizen, just some basic info, you know, driver's license or social security card or a passport. If they're on a, have a green card or a permanent resident alien or a visa of some kind, we're going to ask for that paperwork to see how long it's good for to make sure they can get, and they have a social security number as well before we can make sure that they qualify. So these are the basic things we're going to ask for your client. Now, let me go back before we go to the next slide about the difference between a pre-approval and a pre-qualification, because this is important. And we have a unique program called the Everest Advantage that you need to be aware of. Um, a lot of companies use these terms interchangeably, but there is a difference. Um, a pre-qualification is a client fills out an application online, doesn't provide any of this documentation. Whoops, sorry doesn't provide any of this documentation to us, but just wants to know, based on the information I provided on my application, I'm telling you I make $10,000 a month. Um, and you're just gonna have to take my word for it. And you can pull my credit, see what kind of debts I have, that's fine. But I'm not gonna provide you with any of this stuff. I'm telling you I make 10,000 a month. I'm telling you I have 100,000 in the bank. I'm telling you I've never been divorced, had a bankruptcy. I'm just telling you that, you gotta take my word for it. How much do I qualify for? We'll do that all day long. We'll tell a client, based on what you've told us, this is how much of the house you can buy. But until we have verified all this stuff, it's simply a pre-qualification and it is could totally change if once we get your income, you make much less than you said you did or you have any of these issues we've talked about. That's a pre-qualification versus a pre-approval is we take a full application with the client and gather all this income and asset documentation and review it to verify it's accurate and then tell the client based on that extra information exactly what they qualify for. So based on those two scenarios, you can see a pre-approval 
has high, much more efficacy than a pre-qualification. And why that's so important that you have your clients get pre-approved is a lot of lenders, particularly brokers or people that haven't done this a long time or have a great reputation, they will only do a pre-qualification because it's easy and they're a little bit lazy, to be honest, versus a pre-approval that takes a little bit more time and is more detailed and more of an effort just because they don't want to do it. And they'll do a pre-qualification to tell your client, yeah, you're qualified for $500,000 house, go at it. And the agent goes out, gets them under contract. And then they have to start getting this documentation. And then they find out, oh my gosh, they don't make how much money they said they did. They do have some of these issues. Now they don't qualify for a $500,000 house. They only qualify for a $300,000 house. Now the agent's irate, the client wasted all this time and it does not end well. So when you, when you have a client uh, work with the lender, you wanna make sure they get fully pre-approved, meaning everything's been reviewed and looked at. We will even go at Inspira a step further and that's called the Everest Advantage in that we will do everything I just mentioned, plus we will have an underwriter review and underwrite the file as a second layer of, of security to make sure that everything is exactly the way that we're, the loan officer says it is, that they're good to go, so that you can go out with confidence and find them a house. And then at that point, all we need is a contract to get the, the, the uh, plug and play and we can close really fast. It's called the Everest Advantage. You'll hear more about it as you're at Everest. Uh, the nice thing about the Everest Advantage as well is that if someone goes through the Everest Advantage process, we can often close in as little as 14 days once they go under contract. So much faster because we've done so much work up front. It takes a little longer than a pre-approval. Pre-approval we can do pretty quick. Everest Advantage may take a week or two to get done, but you can close so much faster when you've got that uh, in your hand. So pre-approval, I just can't emphasize enough making sure that you get that before your clients start looking at houses. Any questions? All right. House hunting. Once we get them pre-approved and we give, we let you know, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Smith are pre-approved for a $500,000 house. Um, now they're going to go out and start looking at homes. We're going to send you a pre-approval letter. This is all you. This is where you, this is your process um, in the house. I mean, you've done lots of work, but this is this is where we've kind of passed the baton back to you and said, okay, they're pre-approved, go find them a house. And once you're under contract, we'll take care of the rest. Again, a pre-approval letter is critical. When we get you, the client pre-approved, we are gonna send you a physical letter and we'll email it to you. <laughs> uh, but we'll send you a physical letter that will, you will wanna include with all of your offers. Anyone that lists a house and is accepting offers, they wanna see that the people buying the house have already been pre-approved to buy it. Um, they're gonna require a pre-approval letter. Um, and so we're gonna make sure you have that. We, we have a mobile app called Pronto that's fantastic that you should all have on your phones. You can get with Jennifer Morris, our business development specialist or any of our loan officers and get the mobile app on your phone uh, because it's an app that you can share with your clients that allows them to get pre-approved on their phone, on their tablets, on their computers, online um, pretty quickly. And then that way you're in, in the know of what's happening and you can actually get your pre-approval letter through that, uh, that app um, once we've issued it. And it just makes communication really easy. And then when they are under contract, you get automatic updates through the app um, and it makes your life so much better, quicker, smoother with communication. What is or, that called again? It's called Pronto, like Pronto, hurry up. P -R -O -O. Uh, okay. It's called the Pronto mobile app, and you can get it from, Tracy, where are you? Are you in California or Utah? I'm in Utah in Iron County. Okay. And who's your, um, what, which branch? St. George. St. George. Okay. So you can get with mm -hmm. Alex down there. Uh -huh. um, you can also contact Jennifer Morris. Um, is probably a better source. Um, she's our business development specialist. She can get you hooked up on the Pronto app um, and get it downloaded to your phone um, and away you go. Okay, and I'm on Homebot too, which is great. so cool. Thank Good. you. You bet. Yeah, Homebot's a great tool that we talked about at Summit the other day um, that you all ought to be on. That's free. Okay, a couple of things that you want to make sure that you're, you are you know, once you get under contract, a few tips of the trade, uh, particularly if you're a newer agent that you want to be aware of in reviewing the REPSI um, in one, one section one, I think it's still section 1.2. I know the contracts just changed in California, Utah, and I may need to update this slide, but there's a section that talks about items that are included in the contract. Um, and when you get 
And so a lot of times agents, they get very creative and say, hey, we want to buy the house, but we want you to include the swing set in the backyard and the hot tub that's on the deck um, and that couch that's in the living room and da, 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 right? We want to buy the house, but you got to include these things in the price. Um, don't do that because we're going to have to ask you to take them right out of the contract. We, uh, when it comes to purchase contracts, the purchase price from a lending standpoint can only include the actual house. Now, it, it, the window blinds can be included, the appliances can be included, that's fine because they can be considered part of the house. But other personal property items cannot be included in the contract because that's giving value and we can't lend uh, on a loan where you're giving value to any personal property outside of the house itself. And so um, if you wanted to have those items included in the contract, you need to do some separate contract with the client and the agent or the other agent for those things. We cannot see them in the actual purchase contract rep seat. We're just going to have to have you take it out and it's going to be more work for you. And you're going to have to go back and it makes you look a little silly that you put it in there initially and just take it out later. So word of advice, don't put personal property items outside of things that are attached to the house already. Um, which obviously a pool is attached to the house. Maybe an ingrown hot tub is attached to the house. The appliances can be considered, window coverings be considered, but everything else is not um, considered. That, and that includes solar, you know, solar uh, panels. Um, if anyone still has satellite dishes, which you don't see very much, that, that has to be treated separately and it causes some issues. So you can reach out to us if you have uh, questions about that. The other thing is, um, Oftentimes, the buyer, you, will ask the sellers to pay the closing costs we talked about, some or all of the closing costs that the buyer has to incur. You will ask the sellers to do that. Now, right now, in this market, the last two years, we're not seeing hardly any of that um, because it's a seller's market and sellers are not willing to pay anything for a buyer. In a normal market, about half the contracts we get, um, the the buyer's agent has negotiated the sellers to pay some or all of those closing costs, not the down payment, but the closing costs associated with the loan. And you can do that. That's okay. That's fine. You just have to have an addendum in the contract somewhere. Uh, and some contracts have it built in where you're listing the dollar amount or percentage that the seller is paying for that. Uh, lastly, uh, when it comes to contracts, and again, the section 24 may not be the right section anymore, but the section where, and in California is different, but the sections where you're listing deadlines, meaning inspection deadlines, appraisal deadlines, uh, closing and escrow deadlines, before you enter into contracts, you need to talk with your loan officer to make sure you're on the same page with particularly the appraisal deadline and the financing and closing deadline, that you're not putting in dates in there that are unrealistic. Um, sometimes you agents get really aggressive and they want to, you know, they have, they have to maybe because it's super competitive uh, we particularly saw that a year, a year and a half ago when the market was nuts. Uh, but typically it takes about 30 days to get a loan from the time someone gets under contract until they're at the closing table signing. Uh, a 30-day cycle is pretty average. Now, as I told you, we get stuff done in about three weeks, but every loan is different and things can come up uh, that, we have, that you don't have control over. Um, we don't have control over, for example, something could come up on the inspection, right? That the seller needs to address. Something could come up on the appraisal that we need to address. Something can come up with the borrower's employment that we have to address. There are just so many things that we don't know until we get into it. Um, and so you want to make sure you're putting 30-day contract deadlines. Um, on appraisal deadlines and financing deadlines, you usually want to put those out at least three weeks um, and closing deadlines at least four weeks to 30 days. But talk to your loan officer before you willy-nilly just put in dates on your contracts because, again, you don't want to look silly to have to go back to a listing agent and say, hey, we need to extend the contract. I mean, that's going to happen every once in a while, but we want to avoid it as much as possible. And having good, solid contract deadlines in there will help with that. All right. Again, stop me with any questions. Loan documentation, right? So now they're under contract. Um, you found in the house. They're under contract. We've started the process. Now you pass the baton back to us, and we're going to take it to the finish line. We got to start getting loan documentation to get moving on things. Uh, that's when the loan goes into what's called processing. We actually process the loan. And as I mentioned, a mortgage loan is an assembly line. If you, in your mind, you can visualize it like a Ford assembly line where we have to do things in a certain order to get to that closing table. One of the first things we do under contract is processing the loan. 
Processing alone means there's a person here called a processor that is doing literally 101 things on that loan. We got to get the title policy, open escrow. We got to get the appraisal. We got to verify employment. We got to get their copy of their tax transcripts. We got to get um, so another thing from there. We have to verify employment two and three different ways. There's just a million things we have to do. Dot every I, cross every T, and that's called processing. Once the pro and that means gathering all the necessary documentation that we don't already have. That means locking in the interest rate if we haven't already locked it in to make sure that's good to go. We're going to disclose um, on we, we have to by law disclose, as I mentioned, that LE loan estimate. That's just one document of a series of probably 30 or 40 documents we have to disclose to a client per federal law once they go into the contract. Uh, we have to send and the disclosures are the same for everybody. They look exactly the same. It's the same information just with your client's personal doc information transposed onto it. But it's the disclosures are the same for everyone. And it's just federal disclosures that we have to send out that lets them know what their rights are and what to expect. Um, we do that electronically. So they're called e-disclosures. This, you know, mortgage lending these days is very electronic. Um, we don't like to do a lot of wet signatures until we get to the closing table. We try to do everything as much as we can electronic. It's faster, it's more secure, it's more efficient. So we're gonna be sending them these disclosures electronically for them to e-sign. We're gonna order the appraisal. Um, and one thing you all need to know that is very unique to Inspiro is this, is typically agents and clients do not wanna order their appraisal they get under contract and they have a contingency deadline to do some due diligence, meaning they're gonna get an inspection on the house to make sure it's okay. They wanna look at the property, look at the roof, the, the foundation, et cetera. And they typically don't want the appraisal to be ordered until that inspection has been completed and everything's checked off and okay in the event that there is not there is something wrong that makes them wanna back out. And so they don't wanna incur the cost of an appraisal if the inspection comes back bad and they say, never mind, I don't want to buy the house because they can back out after the inspection if they do that within their due diligence time period. Um, but that means that's usually a week to 10 days of lost time and time is of the essence these days. And so we typically would not order appraisals until you gave us the okay, okay, the inspection's done, we're good, go ahead and order the appraisal because you're trying to protect your client's time and not have them incur a cost because the appraisal is a cost that they pay for. But what happens is we just lose all this time. So in Spiro, we take all the risk out of it. The second we get disclosures back, we're gonna order the appraisal immediately, um, which means it's gonna be ordered way before you've ever completed your inspections. But we're not gonna, the, the client's not being charged for the appraisal, we collect that at closing. And if for any reason the client decides not to buy the house because of inspection issues, we're going to absorb the cost of the appraisal. We're not going to charge that to your client. So there's no risk to your client by us ordering the appraisal up front. The upside is that we're going to be that much further ahead of the game and not be waiting on the appraisal to delay things. So just be aware of that. We order the appraisal right away, but we don't. There's no risk to your client. If the deal goes sideways due to inspection issues, they're not going to have to absorb that cost. We will. We're going to order the title policy or the escrow uh, policy in California and get that going right away with the title company of your choice that you tell us to do. Hopefully that's um, in Utah, North Star title, and in California, All Valley Escrow. We're gonna order the hazard policy. Again, that's their homeowner's insurance. The client decides who their insurance is with. We don't. They tell us, hey, my insurance is with Allstate. Here's my insurance agent. Um, and we have to get a policy to them based off of a bunch of stuff they need from us. We have to get that insurance policy. These are just some of the things we do. And then all the third party verifications I mentioned to you before, verifications of employment, verifications of deposit, all kinds of stuff, tax returns, tax transcripts, we have to get all those things ordered. And then any other documentation that may be specific to this client, divorce decree, bankruptcy discharge papers, a subordination agreement, there's all, every deal is different. Every client's unique. There may be specific things to this client that are not on this list that we have to get from them. All called processing. And the processor reviews, 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 reviews the name of the game. De the devil's in the details. That's super important. Okay. Once the processor has unprocessed the file and gathered all the physical documents, whether actual physical or electronic, and we have either the appraisal or the title policy back, we then submit the file to underwriting. Under an underwriter is the person legally um, licensed to review files 
and sign off on them and approve them based off of underwriting standards, based off of FHA conventional jumbo VA underwriting guidelines, because they're all different. So these are specialists that actually will look at all that documentation that's been gathered, will look at the application and put it together and say, okay, do these people actually qualify? Yes. Now, do we have all the documentation that we need in the file per lending guidelines so that we can uh, close this loan? Um, typically, when we initially submit a file to underwriting, we don't have everything and that's okay. Um, the underwriter will come back and give us conditions, will tell us the things that we need. So the underwriter looks at four C's of underwriting. There's four things that an underwriter has to look at when it comes to does this borrower qualify? Number one is credit. Do they have credit? Do they have the proper credit? Is the credit report in the file? Are there any issues that we need to address? Is there a collateral in the file? Collateral is the purchase contract. Um, it's the appraisal. It's the title policy. Is that in there? Um, have we reviewed it? Are there any red flags or issues? Title policies may show that there's a lien on the property that the seller had, or the seller on the title policy isn't the person that's actually selling the house. That happens every once in a while. That's an issue. On the appraisal, there could be structural issues or safety issues that the appraiser addresses that the underwriter will catch that need to be fixed. We have to make sure collateral is in line. Number three is compliance. Mortgage financing, just so that you know, is the most regulated industry in the country, period. Um, we are more regulated than anything, any industry, because of the big financial uh, crisis and housing uh, crisis that happened back in 2007, 8, 9, and 10. If you, and if you were old enough to remember that or alive to remember that, you were all alive, but maybe you weren't aware of it. Um, it was a huge kind of mini um, recession and uh, all kinds, caused all kinds of problems. The housing market accounts for a third of our economy. And there was a lot of speculation in housing back then that caused tons of foreclosures, tons of over evaluations, home prices plummeted, people lost their properties, lost trillions of dollars in equity. And so as a result, Congress, as they often do, kind of overstepped and, and put in place all kinds of compliance things to the point where if we don't do things as a mortgage company a certain way, um, as I mentioned, that assembly line, if we do things out of order, the loan is not compliant. You can't close it. We have to start over. Um, and so every I dotted and every T crossed has to be precise and right. Um, it's maddening. It drives us crazy. It is the way that it is. A lot of it doesn't make sense. A lot of it's not intuitive, uh, but it's the world we live in and it is just what mortgage financing is. And they're the same for everybody. So an underwriter has to make sure that the loan's been done properly, the profit disclosures have been issued at the right time, the proper documentation's in the file. Um, because if they don't, and it's not compliant, we're stuck with the loan. We cannot sell that loan in the secondary market, which is Wall Street. It's called the secondary market, which costs us tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars. So compliance is a big part of what we do. The fourth thing is capacity. Uh, that is, does the borrower have the documentation in there to show that they can actually make the payments on the loan? Are their debt ratios in line? Does their income jive with what the file says? Can they make payment on the loan? Do they have the ability to make payment? So those are the four C's an underwriter looks at, credit, collateral, compliance, and capacity. Any questions on the role of an underwriter? Okay. Um, when an underwriter underwrites the file, they issue a conditional pre-approval that says, yep, these guys are approved, but I still need questions about this documentation or we're missing that. I need to address these things. They'll come back and to the processor and say, hey, get this stuff from the borrower, the agent, the client, whoever. Um, and once you satisfy these conditions, I will then clear the file for closing and everything is in order. You can issue the CD, that closing disclosure that I mentioned before, and get ready and prep the file to actually close at the title company or with escrow. Let me ask you a question. Probably this is um, something that I should know already, but um, is the underwriting, I, I'm sorry, underwriter working for the bank or the lender? Us. They work oh, for us. For, for you. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure. But are they more like an independent or not? I mean, like, uh -huh. because sometimes it seems like the underwriter, it is uh, really picky and against, uh, I mean, like trying to, you know, get into a lot of details. And sometimes I feel like, okay, the underwriters, 
uh, obviously, if they do something wrong, you're not going to be able to sell this to the secondary market. So that's why they are so, you know, uh, picky about everything and making sure that everything is is well. Yes. Is that, okay. Yeah. Great. Great question. Um, as I mentioned, there are underwriting guidelines that are the same across the entire country. All underwriting guidelines for FHA are the same. All underwriting guidelines for conventional are the same for conventional loans. Some of the guidelines cross over between loan products, but each FHA has some unique guidelines that are different than conventional, but the guidelines are the same for every company in every state of the United States. Now, and those guidelines are you know, super thick, as I mentioned, over, uh, we're over-regulated. Um, now, with that said, that some guidelines are very black and white, right? Do you have a job? Yes or no. That's black and white. You can't not, you can't get a loan and not have a job. But then there's gray area. Well, how long have you had your job, right? Um, how do I factor your income completely? What documentation do I need to support the income that you're showing? Um, there's a lot of gray area in underwriting. And you're right, not un all underwriters are created equal in that regard. Just like not all mortgage companies are created equal, people view the world differently in how they look at it. Um, and there are, not an Inspiro, but there are some underwriters that view their role almost like an auditor rather than a deal maker. Our underwriters are deal makers. We're in the business of making deals. Some underwriters are in the in business of declining loans because they don't want to issue anything that's not perfect and pristine. Mortgage lending is not a perfect and pristine business. Um, there's a lot of gray hair. Everyone has. You know, part of my expression that has stinky armpits, right? We've all got issues that we're dealing with. Um, and every loan has to be looked at that way. And so our underwriters are trained to make deals. It, it's got to be compliant. We've got to have all these things in here. We've got to be able to sell in the secondary market. But if we can find a way to make it work, we will. But with that said, it's not an exact science. And there may be times that a client or an agent because they don't really understand all the nuances that are required. They may feel like, my gosh, you're asking for all this stuff. Why, 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 why? Well, there could be a million reasons why, but the main reason is it's not, it's not satisfying one of these four things. We need more documentation to make sure the credit, the collateral, the compliance and capacity are doable so that we get audited all the time. All of our files get audited by the secondary market, by the end investor, by FHA, by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, we're getting our stuff audited all the time. And if we don't have everything pristine in the way it's supposed to, guess what? We have to buy that loan back and then it's on our books, which costs us, as I said, tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So as a lender, we're taking on a ton of risk, you know, by doing, it's a risky business. Um, you know, you close the loan, you move on, you're done. We close the loan, we're liable for that loan forever. It never goes away. And so we have to make sure that everything is above board, everything is matching, everything works. And sometimes it may feel like your plants are getting raked over the coals because their situation is so challenging or so difficult or so unique, which is particularly the case with self-employed borrowers. It, sometimes that gets really dicey on how we can calculate income, that it just may feel like that. We're, we're not in the business, and really no lender is in the business of making someone's life miserable, but the client's situation dictates a lot of that how the loan officer structures to the loan dictates a lot of that. We try to make it as smooth as possible. Um, and again, deal making rather than an auditor approach. Um, and we'll, if, if there's an issue, we always reach out to the agent, talk you through and explain to you what's going on. Um, but it could happen, right? Again, that's why the more solid your client is from an approval standpoint, the better. If they are, you know, they've had sketchy credit history over their life. They don't have much money saved. They've jumped from job to job their whole career. Uh, they don't have any money for a down payment. They just started a, a new business. I mean, those are all challenges that make a loan so much harder versus a client, super long job history, fantastic credit score, W-2 agent, a really easy to document, lots of money in the bank. That's an easy deal, right? So it just depends on the client. But just know it in Spiro, we're deal makers, not auditors or deal breakers. Great question. Okay, but client but underwriter clears the file for closing. We're now ready to get everything set up to actually sign documentation at the title company. Um, we begin working on documents at least seven days before your scheduled closing date. So we're, we're starting to prep stuff and reaching out to the title company, getting fees, making sure everything matches. We, we can issue the closing disclosure or the CD anytime 
after the initial approval by the underwriter, but it has to be issued at least three days before you can close. Well, that's important because sometimes, this is not common, but sometimes a loan has been so challenging that we couldn't get an approval until the day before uh, the contract says they're supposed to close. So it says they're supposed to close, what's today? Today's the 13th. Let's say that the loan's supposed to close on the 15th, okay? But we finally got our approval by the underwriter today. So we can't, today's the first day we could actually issue the CD. Well, by law, we can't close for three business days after the CD is issued. Your contract says you're supposed to close in two days. We can't close for three days. It means you're not to go back and get an extension on the contract of a day or two because we, by law, can't close any faster. That's why getting the CD out early is so critical. Sometimes we can't because of the situation, but nine and a half times out of 10, we're getting the CD out well before the three-day time period so you don't run into that. Uh, once a file has been cleared to close, um, you can go ahead and get your closing time scheduled. We usually advise you don't schedule your closing time or actual day. Usually we're, we're getting done in time that you can actually move up your closing, not push it back, move it up. But we advise that you not actually schedule a time and day until the file has been cleared to close, just so that you don't look silly in front of a, an agent or a client say, hey, let's schedule it for Thursday. And then we say, you know, you can't close Thursday, you can't close till Friday. Then you got to go back and tell everybody. It's best to wait till you hear from the lender. File's clear to close. You can close anytime or anytime after the state and then get that scheduled. And so again, you must wait three days from the time the CD is issued. You'll know when the CD is issued, particularly if you have the app, it kind of tells you that the CD has been issued. Um, we send funds to title in advance of the closing date. So that way they have the funds there. So sometimes we can actually, you can actually sign now, you can't really do this in California because it's the recordings are a little bit more challenging there than in Utah. But in Utah, you could theoretically close, sign the documents, close it, and fund it the same day. Um, but to do that, you have to actually sign the documents in the morning in order to be able to fund and record by the afternoon. California, it's always the next day just because they have to physically go down and record documents where in Utah, it's electronic. One of these days, we'll get California in line, I tell you. <laughs> Um, funds are then disp uh, are dispersed once we issue it and we have all the documentation back. So meaning all the documentation of the signing table has to be signed. We have to have an electronic copy of that sent back to us for us to review uh, before we will authorize the title company and escrow to release funds and actually record the closing. Um, if we do not have documentation back or something was missed and has to be re-signed, it could delay the actual funding and closing of the loan. Um, and that's not... Uh, that doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does. Um, and usually that's an issue with title, that they just forgot something or didn't sign it the right way. Um, that happens every once in a while, but very infrequently. But just FYI, um, we have to make sure that all the documentation has been signed properly and, and at least electronically returned. We don't have, to have the physical documents back, but at least uh, a scanned copy of it to make sure that it's been reviewed and everything's in order. Then when it funds, this is the best day you give keys you know you're ready to give keys or ready to get keys and your clients are free to move in um, and they are good to go and this is the best day this is when your commissions are issued um, and you are all set all right that uh we've been spending what is that an hour and a half a little over an hour and a half and reviewing process terminology everything um i hope this has been super informative You've learned something. Um, it's helped you be a better agent. Do you, any of you have any questions about anything? We went over through a lot of information at you. Um, probably information overload, but that's the purpose of it, just to get you exposed to it. Do you have any questions about the process or anything in general or any random lending question that I can help you with? I have a question, Chris. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking to a client who is in the process of, you know, shopping around for a loan even before they are looking at houses yeah. um what is the best way to go about finding the like fees and closing costs involved in a loan at someone other than inspiro yeah great question number one they should be doing that right they should be getting pre-qualified and getting the financing in order before they start looking um number two you know we will always provide you know to get fees and costs you have to get pre-approved meaning you have to fill out an application we need to get some basic information from them so we can determine what those fees and costs are because um, closing costs 
some closing costs are fixed, uh, no matter what the loan amount is. So that I told you our 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 Inspiro fees, the thirteen ninety, that includes underwriting fee, processing fee, closing fee. That's lumped together. That thirteen ninety, that's a fixed cost. That doesn't change whether someone's borrowing one hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. Our fee is the same. Okay. Um, there's a few. There's half the closing cost fees are fixed regardless of loan amount, but the other half that have to do with title, they are variable based on the loan amount itself. So if you borrow a hundred thousand dollar loan, your title fees are a lot less than if you borrow a million dollar loan, because the title insurance premiums are so different. We don't control that. The title companies control that. Um, now those fees are pretty standard. They don't vary very much from title company to title company because they have to report those fees with the state insurance commission, um, and they have to be competitive. So title insurance fees are pretty, like lender fees, are pretty equal, right? There, there may be a few hundred dollar difference here and there. Um, across the board. But um, you have to get that from, well, so what I'm saying is you have to get totally pre-approved for us to be able to let a client know what those fees look like. Because again, whether they borrow 100,000 or 500,000, it's gonna, the variable fees are gonna be different. So they need to know what, what the amount is. If they wanna get a comparison quote, you know, if they've gotten approved with Mountain America Credit Union, they wanna get a comparison quote with us, that's great, we'd love to do that. Um, I can tell you, we'll usually be able to beat whatever someone's doing. Um, if they're wanting to get another lending um, a pre-approval, they can with anybody. They have to go through the whole process twice, though, with another lender getting pre-qualified, providing documentation, having their credit pool, they're kind of going through that process. So they can then, you know, kind of look at apples to apples. Um, I would tell you this, it's um, as a, as a, the thing that's most important with your client um, is that you can get the deal done right, that you're going to perform as an agent and the lending company can get the deal done. I would not be bending, uh, picking up, uh, you know, picking up pennies and stepping over dollars kind of a, a analogy, meaning there's always somebody out there that is willing to do something for less. I'm just going to tell you that just like there's always agents out there willing to do something for less, right? You guys work on, are trained and taught to hold on to your commission. Don't, you know, don't give it up. Don't fight for it. But you know, there's exit and the real companies out there, homie, that are doing something for a flat fee or a 1% commission, right? And there's a huge difference in what you're able to do versus what they're able to do. The same thing when it comes to lending. Um, I would highly advise that you try to negotiate for your client, excuse me, highly advise against you trying to negotiate for your client to try to find the lowest fee lender out there because you're kind of kicking your, your support people in the fanny. Just like I would never tell our, our age, our loan officers to say, hey, Everest charges, you know, 3% or six commit commissions. You could refer this agent at exit that's only going to charge them one. That is just asinine to do, right? And so it's the experience is what's most important for a client. They're trusting you. They want to make sure the deal gets done. That's going to get done on time. They're going to be educated. They're going to hold their hand through the experience and teach them the process. Whether someone's fees are $200 less or $200 more, if I'm an agent, is not my concern, right? And I'm not trying to help them with that process because I'm referring them to someone that I know that will get the deal done. Now, with that said, there's always someone out there, a client that, listen, I'm only going to go with the lowest whatever that I can find. That's fine. And that, there's, there's validity to that. And in those situations, we'll always typically match or beat someone else's fees because we want to make sure they are getting the best deal and that you are able to keep the loan here because that's going to be a better experience for you as an agent. But to get comparison rates, you're going to have to, they're going to have to go through the process more than once with multiple companies. Um, and then they can start comparing apples to apples on, on what the fees and the rates look like. So that was a long answer to your question, but it does get complicated. But I would just advise you, know, you you're, you're a real estate expert. You are not a mortgage expert. None of you are, and you won't be. Um, because there's, it's too complicated. Uh, you have to become a loan officer to understand it. Um, but you need to know enough to be dangerous. You can talk the talk and explain things to them. But I would highly advise not getting in, involved in um, looking at saying, hey, you know, is this lender cheaper? Or is this rate better? I mean, my advice is, hey, this is the lender that I love to use because I know they get the deal done. They provide amazing service. They're super fast. I work really well with them. That's why I want to use them. Um, I'm not, and I know they're super competitively priced and you're going to get a fair deal um, rather than some agents are almost like a financial advisor to their clients and they start looking at interest rates and fees and stuff with lender to lender 
and it convolutes the water and it, all, and it does create kind of an adversarial relationship with their lender um, for the same reasons that you would want a lender to kind of negotiate for your client to find a different agent, if that makes sense. A great question. Any other questions that um, I can answer at all about any topic? Okay, you've been great. Um, have a great 2022. Come to any of our offices, talk to any of our team members with any questions. We are here to help you. Uh, take advantage of the Emerson Manage program. Um, let us know whatever we can do. Um, we're here to help and we want you all to be super successful and wish you nothing but the very, very best in what you're doing. Um, and uh, with that, um, have a great rest of your day and long weekend um, with your family and friends. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. You bet.